Shalom, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday Men's Study. Today we're on Galatians chapter 3. Um, <clears throat> we're kind of building up to this. Uh, we can see from verse 1, it starts out with, Oh, foolish Galatians. So as we're going to get a little bit more involved with what was actually the deception. I know sometimes we, we kind of veer off on all the many types of deceptions that happen, but I think that it'll be it'll do us well to kind of focus on the deception that he's speaking of in Galatians. So in Galatia, we all we all remember verse uh, chapter one and two where he's talking to the Galatians and he's saying, you know, how did you allow these these individuals who who were of the circumcision? meaning that they were blood relatives that were now professing to follow Yahushua. And they were coming in and they were now revealing a different way of salvation, a different way to obtain salvation. Uh, we saw that one of the verses where it said that he did, that Titus did not compel, was not compelled to, to be circumcised, though there was a teaching going around, uh, around saying that circumcision uh, was to lead to salvation. That cert without circumcision, there was no salvation. Um, so we also saw that there was a prejudice that was still going on between the the believing those uh, Yahudim or those Jews who believed in Yahushua and the na the heathen or the, not the heathen, sorry, the nations, the Gentiles that began to believe in Yahushua as well. And we saw in chapter two that Paul had to actually withstand not only Paul, uh, Peter, but the Jews that was with Peter and Barnabas because they separated themselves because they didn't want to see, be seen by the other Yahudim eating with, with the Gentiles. Um, and it just showed a partiality and Paul kind of was showing like, this is not, this is not fit. You cannot be preaching to be Israel because this is one of the major statements. Let's go to chapter two. And he made a statement saying to Peter, he says in verse 14, in verse 14, he says, he says, but when I saw that, that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the good news, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Yahudim live after the manner of the nations and not as do the Yahudim, why do you compel the nations to live as Yahudim? So it's interesting because Peter is compelling the nations to live like Yahudim. And Paul is saying, that's not a bad thing if the Yahudim are living according to Torah. You understand? So this should also bring another understanding that the Yahudim was inviting the nations to live as Yahudim. So here goes that Israel separation of the nations thing. It doesn't exist because they're compelling them to be as Yahudim. So now that he's telling them to be as Yahudim, he stands up and he separates himself as a prejudiced individual. And now Paul is saying, how are you going to tell them to live like you and then you be impartial? You acting like them, you want them to live like you. You see that? So it's interesting that there was no problem with him telling them to act, to live like the Yahudim because they were supposed to live according to Torah. There was only a problem when they did not live according to Torah. Now they, he's like, who cares what, what Yahudim, what you're doing? You're living like the nations. You know, so it's very interesting how your identity as far as blood rel re relation means nothing if you're not walking uprightly according to Torah and according to the principle. So with that being said, let's continue to, to see what Paul is saying about what was being taught, because we're going to get into the covenants. We're going to get into quite a few things. So let's leave, read the first the first 10 verses. Galatians chapter three. Uh, go ahead, Brother Rudd. Yeah, I didn't want to miss what you brought out in, in verse 14 of chapter 2 because it's important when he said before them all um, because one of the things that, that, that has to happen, um, it says in uh, 1 Timothy 5.20, it says, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all 
that the rest may also fear. So it was important that he said what he said so that no one else would follow what Peter was doing at that moment. That's a, where's that verse? Where's that verse located? I, I, I forgot. I didn't hear you. You said Second Timothy? Oh, you, 1 you said, Timothy 5.20. 1 Timothy 5.20. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people get they get caught off guard with the whole, you know, go, you have to go to your brother in private. You do if you know that that person is in a fault. Right. The person is doing it in front of everybody. They got to get corrected in front of everybody because exactly what the scripture says, because so that way everybody can see the, the correct way to do it instead of just that one person, you know, um, it's kind of like yeah. if my son, my oldest son does something in front of his siblings, incorrect, and I come and pull him to the side and correct him privately, his siblings are going to still think that what their older brother did was okay. But Absolutely. if I correct in front of them, then they start to fear as well. They start to learn, okay, yeah, this is not right because he's getting in trouble for that, you know. Yeah, so, the privately yeah, no. is when you understand that your brother is, is fallen. Um, but it's not public, and only you know. So you go to that brother to, to make sure that he repents. If he does not, then you open up the floodgates. You know what I mean? Right. That's why it tells you to go get witnesses, because there is no witnesses. But if everybody is there publicly, everybody is a witness. So now everybody needs to know what is the right way to do it. So praise God. Um, don't don't step ahead of yourself and not think before you correct. You got to make sure it lines up before you correct, and then you end up being corrected yourself, which is to me is no problem if you want to get corrected. Also, um, what they say, come correct. <laughs> you better come correct, or you get correct. No, no, no. I, I got I drink a, a energy V8 today, so <clears throat> all right. So the first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 3. Um, anybody want to read it? Verse 1 to 10. Okay, I'll read I can it. Read. Okay, go ahead, brother. Oh, senseless <clears throat> Galatians, who has put you under a spell not to obey the truth before whose eyes Yahushua Messiah, Messiah was clearly portrayed among you as impaled. This only I wish to learn from you. Do you receive the Ruach by works of Torah or by hearing of belief? Are you so senseless? Having begun in this Ruach, do you not, do you know, I'm sorry, do you now end in the flesh? Have you suffered so much in vain if indeed in vain. Is he then who has supplied the Ruach to you and working miracles among you, doing it by the Torah or by hearing of belief? Even so, Abraham did believe Elohim and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Know then that those who are of the belief are of sons, are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, having foreseen that Elohim would declare right the nations by belief, announced the good news to Abraham beforehand, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you, so that those who are of belief are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as much as our works of the Torah are under the curse, for it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue in all that is that has been written in the book of the Torah to do them. That's right. Okay, brother. You wanna what do you wanna do? I'm going back after mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I can't no, I walk got... through at the same time, so I have to go back and again. All right. All right. It's an interesting thing. Before I go to you, Omeka, I want to just point out real quick. Um, 
I remember on Friday we talked about the faith, right? Departing from the faith means to depart from the foundational understanding of belief. You don't just believe whatever. You don't believe nothing. You believe something. That's why it calls it the hearing of faith. You know, it said that the Ruach came by the hearing of faith, meaning that there was a teaching that you received and accepted as truth. That is why when you heed seducing doctrines, you depart from the faith. So you can receive the faith by accepting the truth, which is teachings of what is true, such as the death of the resurrection of Messiah. Or you can depart from the faith by saying, now I have to circumcise in order to receive salvation from Messiah. I must first be circumcised. Now you have now created a new faith. The faith is based off of the teachings. You cannot have faith unless you believe something. And if you believe false ideas, it is a false faith. This is why it's very important to understand faith and departing from the faith, as mentioned in Timothy. So here it says hearing of the faith. Is it by the law? or by hearing of the faith. What do you mean hearing of the faith? That means that you heard truth, which is referred to as the faith. And when you leave that truth, you leave that faith. Just making it, just want to point out that because there's a lot in these first 10 verses. I uh, just want to lay that down before we, we read. Go ahead, Rod. Yeah, I think it's interesting, uh, in, uh, important to point out to listen or obey would be the translation of that word here as in as in um as we see in the gospels as we see in romans you know what i mean hearing also means obeying listening as opposed to being swayed you know and turned away from what you heard from what you listened to from what you believed now you're believing this other thing you know because he says who has bewitched you who Right. How did you how did you lose wisdom? The foolishness is called is saying, how did you lose the wisdom that we that see? Right. You know, it's not saying you're you're not intelligent, it's saying, where is the wisdom that you received this hearing and obeying, you know, with? Right. Um, you replaced it. You replaced the wisdom with something else. It's you like know, that's why he, mm -hmm. it's like when you you know, we we talked to someone, you know, we were talking to someone not too long ago. Um, and when I say we, I mean the fellowship. And the person was, was in seminary. They were, they were going with what we were saying. Then they went back and started asking the professors and they changed their mind again and left. You know, and it's, it's very important to understand what you're hearing for yourself. Otherwise, you will be swayed by what someone else interprets it to be. Right. And, and and that's a very important thing because even the Hebrew word amunah for faith means stable, like steadfast, mm -hmm. grounded. To be a uh, hearing of faith and you're not stable, you have not really received and obeyed the faith. You know, even though Yah has mercy, Yah has mercy on us where he's trying to get us to understand so that way we can be stable or we can have emunah or faith. But if we don't understand that truth, there's no way you can be stable. You can say you believe whatever you want, but if you don't understand, then you're going to be waved, tossed to and fro. Every wave of doctrine to move you away from the faith. That's why it says bewitched. Like who's bewitched you? It's like, a, like some type of brainwashing you know because it's like crazy to move away from, from such simple truths you know uh it's different from our time you see they received it first you see our time we received the false one first so now there's this correction this correction of indoctrination this is much different than what they were going through the gentiles just received it for the first time and then someone came in and took that away. So that's why he's like, what in the world? You know, like, what's going on? Uh, but uh, go ahead, go ahead, Emeka, and go ahead, Brother Nathaniel. You can go ahead and let Nathaniel go first. 
Oh, you, okay. Since you read, yeah, and I'll go after him. Um, just not much when you said that. That brought to me um, James 1 and 8. Uh, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Um, because, yeah, because if you either you're in the faith or you're not. Either you serve one or you serve the other. And if you're, you know, so if you're in the faith, you're in it. But, you know, so you can't, I think that's why, you know, it's, it, when you said unstable, that made me think about it. Because if you're not in the faith, you're looking for different doctrines. You're looking, you're, you're seeking, you're, you know, you don't quite act the way we should. You don't carry the way you should. You say, he's like, you know, like, um, not that he wasn't in the faith, but Peter, you know, he's acting one way in front of some people, then acting another way in, in, in right. another instant. And so that's why it's uh, deserving of correction because, you know, you, you have to be set on a straight path so that you, right. you don't teeter or totter because, you know, and then, you know, then you're going to be lost and you're going to be tossed around. And that leads people down different rabbit holes and different things where they, you know, they're in the faith and strong. And then you you you're, you're seeking all this other stuff that's not of faith um right. you're adding on to it it becomes a burden you know it's it, it's it's not a delight and i think that the cares of doing all that throw a lot of people off because you know it's just you can't hold your balance because you're unstable and then you're going to fall somewhere that's not on the path that leads to the kingdom and uh one of the things it was and analyze himself which a lot of us do we don't analyze ourselves before making that step that's why it says proverbs it says in all of your ways in all of our ways acknowledge him and he shall direct mm -hmm. our path you know mm -hmm. lean not to our own understanding but in all our ways acknowledge him so what did peter do when he saw them right away he went on impulse he went on what he was used to before and so did all the other Yahudim. They Barnabas got up, or the Jews that was with him got up. They resulted on impulse instead of analyzing why am I, why am I feeling this type of way? Why don't I want to be seen in this type of environment? You know, sometimes I got to do the same thing. You know, we got to all kind of be slow. We got to be slow to speak a lot because we have to make sure that we're representing the correct. Uh, perspective. It says shun the appearance of evil. So we got to make sure that we're demonstrating the correct view of Yah and his son. You know, we don't want to be, you know, making it look like Yah wants his people to be prejudiced. Mm -hmm. Not true. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, like, true. I like what you, how you put it last week in the last study, you were saying, you know, you know, whoever I'm around, you know, that's who I'm, I am who I am. Like, I'm not going to change, you know, if I'm around a group of people and, you know, I'm explaining to them, I'm talking to them, I'm sharing with them, you know, and I see, I see Jadiel and Rick and, and JP and, and, and Emeka and I see y'all coming down the street. I ain't going to run across the street and act like I wasn't with those guys. Right. Number one, y'all know my character. So, you know, what I was doing was honorable. So I'm going to, I'm going to stay and I'm going to speak, you know, and I think, you know, for Peter and the dynamic of what he was around, you know, caused him to, to shudder at that moment and step away, not understanding that the gospel was for all, all who believe from the beginning, you know, even from the beginning. You know, so. And, and I, I don't want to take it, go against Peter fully because what you just said reminded me like, there's a lot of people who started to believe in Yahushua that was still perpetuating this prejudiced view. They're not circumcised, so they can't be saved. So you can imagine in Jerusalem constantly hearing these different Pharisees that, that converted, converted Pharisees and Sadducees to follow Yahushua still have this problem, and he's constantly hearing this. You know, So when they walk in, he gets up he feels some type of way, you know, so I don't want to, it could be many things. And because once Paul pointed it out, we don't see Peter. When you go to the book of Acts, you don't see Peter battling at all. He's like, all right, let's bring it to every, let's bring this to everybody else. And then he, he, he supported Paul 
when they went to that council in in Acts 15 also. So, you know, we don't we could see the humility, but we could see that he also caught himself. Like, oh, okay, nah, let's let's make sure that everybody else sees that as well. You know, so um, Ameka, you said you wanted to go after Nate and then JP. Yes, sir. Um, I was looking at uh, when you when you read um, when you started reading it was it was interesting because you came across that part. Uh, I'm trying to pull it up right now. You came across that part in Galatians where it says, uh, you know, he says after he says, oh, okay, so he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Yahushua Hamashiach have been evidently set forth, crucified among you. You know, and, cor and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it just, he just said that Yahushua was crucified in front of these people. And that could have only happened by means either Yahushua was dragged to their city and crucified, or they came to Jerusalem to the feast of unleavened bread and Pesach and witness the crucifixion. So it even shows you, for me, one of the things that stuck out, because it even shows you that, you know, if that's the case, that they went to the feast, that the Gentiles were keeping the feast days, <laughs> going to Jerusalem to keep the feast days, keeping their customs, as, you know, uh, Paul just mentioned, you know, in, in what he said to, to, to Peter. But it shows you that they were used to the customs uh, of the Yahoo. I mean, they were used to the feast days. They were used to keeping the Sabbath, you know, as we even see further proof in uh, Acts chapter 13. You know, they were used to doing these things. Like, they were fully indulged in the customs of the Yahoo. Dean. You know, and for me, it, it gets to the point where, you know, it's like this gets so like it this gets so overlooked you know by people who read the scriptures or like you mentioned before who are who have received the lie first that when they read the scriptures they don't see these things or even even they don't look for these things or see them like oh you know or even get their mind to go there you know because that's very key in letting kind of helping you understand the mentality that the gentiles had back then you know, very important to understand the mentality that the Gentiles had back then, before and after Mashiach. So I just thought that was really interesting in that in that first verse. Mm, right. Um, it, when you when we go through when we went through the Book of Acts, we kept seeing Gentiles at the synagogues. You know, and um, Messiah made a statement about, even though it was a negative statement, he said that the Pharisees would go far and wide trying to proselyte, trying to make converts, and then made them worse, the worst type of individuals, worse than them, you know. So it was not, you're right, you know, because I'm one of those people who was reading it with the narrative that was given to me because of the way that the system is is working. It's the same system like the government system, whatever system is like, I'm dependent on the people who gave me this information. So I don't feel adequate to reason with the information. So I just accept it. So when I'm reading, I'm not catching none of this. And so now this is why I think one of the things you said at Mecca before is the second time I'm bringing it up. You said it's a, it's a culture shock when you come up to, when you go to these people, you can't just blurt out because they got to now reevaluate their whole entire culture, the whole entire way that they lived, you know, because they're going to have to now rearrange that whole lifestyle according to a new understanding of the same scripture, you know. So it's the same thing that these guys are going through. They had this prejudice. They had these traditions. And now they had to now re rearrange that whole mindset and you can see it still is still lingering. You know, you got to be circumcised to get his salvation. Oh, we accept Messiah now, but we still got to 
we still got to do something else too. You see what I'm saying? So it's it's like you can see that that mindset is still there. The the Yahudim kind of is going through what we are going through. The Gentiles are not. They're just receiving it fresh. But the Yahudim, are, they have to go against all those traditions. They didn't talk to Samaritans. They didn't go to Centurion's house. They don't even have a Torah, an instruction from Yah that says it. You know, they don't have no instructions from Yah, but they just they just did it. Paul Peter would not go into no Centurion's house. But when he saw the Ruach fall, he was like, what in the world? You see what I'm saying? So our minds have to also be changed, you know, for all of us who, who was who was in a culture and now we're moving into the correct culture of scripture, you know, because it is a culture at the end of the day. That's why Paul is very specific when he says that Yahudim is one inwardly. It's, it's, it's who, who you are as far as a walk, as far as a, the way that you think. You can be blood relative and not, and like what Paul said, not be walking according you're walking like the nations. But if you're a Yahudim, if you're in the culture, if you're in Israel, you walk like a Yahudim. And who's the who's the example the Yahudim example? Who's the example of the of, of Judah? It's Messiah. He's the Yahudim that is the example of how to walk, how to be in that culture. You know, so to me the it's not a it's not a reflection on the people because the people were also have to be grafted back in. And you see, Paul is trying to get his people back in the, the culture, in the correct culture, because he was entering into the correct culture. We're going in, we're going way too far. All right. So um, go ahead, Rod, and then JP. Yeah, real quick, I was just commenting on um, on what Mecca said because he said. He said that you know their eye, he he focused in on their eyes seeing Yahushua Messiah crucified, and I just wanted to add to that whole thing because I think in the King James it says um it says whose eyes Yahushua Messiah was clearly portrayed. That word portrayed translate to the word placarded, like a placard, like a like a like a billboard like you know how you see a billboard on your way somewhere you never forget that billboard like that's it's etched in your mind you know how did you go from seeing that publicly to now thinking that you have to do some work to get what he died for you know mm. it's just like you know it brings more it brings more um it brings more understanding to the wisdom that was lost when they witnessed Yahushua Messiah right. die. Right. So I just wanted to add to what he brought out. It was it was good. Right, right. Because the eyes, it says, whose eyes? He's talking about the Galatians' eyes. Whose eyes Yahushua have been set forth is mm. placard in front of you. Like I, this was presented to you, and now you're, you, you know, what does it say? It says you received the ruach. By the works of the Torah or by the receiving or the obedience of the faith, of the truth? Oh foolish, have you begun in the Ruach? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh or by your actions or by your own strength? You know, so this is this is like transforming the whole walk, actually. One in faith, one in works, one in the strength of Yah and Messiah, one in your own strength. This is like transforming the whole walk. You know, but it's interesting how how Hasatan does that. He doesn't get rid of the faith. He changes it and twists it up and presents a whole brand new one, you know, instead of, you know, it's too easy for us to recognize somebody trying to get rid of it. But now nah, somebody got to make it look different and exciting. Let's, oh, wow. You mean if I get circumcised, I could get more power? I get closer to him? Come on. You know, we do that today. There's a lot of people out there like, oh, if we if we do this, oh, I read read these books and now I'm just enlightened. I got the wisdom of a thousand magi. Like, no, it, like, come on, you know. You don't even remember what's in Isaiah. You want to, anyway. Uh, JP, go ahead, JP. 
we got to enjoy the simplicity of the message and not let anything remove that simple, simple truth away from our eyes. We, when we add to truth and build on it, it's different from removing it and now starting a brand new foundation. You know, you got to be careful. JP, you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. I've been here. I ain't going nowhere. Hallelujah. Uh, I just want to, I like what he says here in uh, verse six. He says, even as Abraham believed Elohim and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And I was like, wow, like this is, you know, like we're talking about faith, like belief, like is what he was counted for righteousness. And, and the verse I wanted to take it to is um, Genesis 15, verse six. And it says, and he believed in Yahuwah and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now that, and again, that doesn't, that doesn't take us away from, um, you know, from him not keeping the commandments. I think yeah. uh, I know that verse is somewhere in, in this book of Genesis uh, where it says he kept, a, you know, law, statutes and commandments, mm -hmm. um, something like that. I'm trying to find out. I, I know I had it, but I, I lost it right now. I think it's Genesis 25, verse 6. 25? 25, one of those. 25, verse 6 or 26, verse 5. Oh, there it is. See, yeah, yeah, you're right. 26, 26 5, yeah. Yeah, 26, 5. It says, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So, I mean, but it was just like, but by his faith, by his belief, by what he did, you know, just to listen to Yahuwah is like, he, it was counted him for righteousness. You know, because we think about, I, I say that because I was thinking about righteousness and like, you know, we, we were going to have that in a question coming up too, like calling yourself righteous. And if that's, but it's just in that mindset of like righteousness, like we're in a time period, I feel like where people, they, they don't even want to claim righteousness. They don't even want to like, it's like they take that far away from them instead of trying to, um, you know, grasp on to the righteousness and want to live by righteousness and be seen by Yahuwah as a righteous man, you know? Mm. And, um, and the last thing I will say is, um, um, well, I'll leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. Let's go right there. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the thing to be accounted for him for righteousness accounted for him by who? By the people around him? The people around him saw him as righteous? No. He believed and Yah deemed him righteous. Yah was like, you are now righteous. This is the this is this is the transformation point in belief. In belief of what? In belief in what Yah promised. I said this, you establish it as fact before it even happens and walk according to the promise you are already you begin righteous and continue righteously just like he said how are you begun in the ruach and now you're trying to finish off with your own strength you start with the ruach you finish with the ruach so a lot of it's just like when we were talking about purification one shabbat we we're talking about purification you are purified the moment that you go into your purification point after your your separation the women's separation then there's a purification point you are already past the unclean point you are now purified and now the rest of the time you are in a purification time period but you have already started purified you're already already moved away from the uncleanliness likewise when we start with Yah, we start righteous. You don't figure out the righteousness on the way, or you don't get more righteous. You get all the righteousness in the beginning, because righteousness doesn't, it doesn't grow based off of what you know. It grows based off of how you trust Yah. How do you believe His word? That's what deems you righteous, because it doesn't matter. Whatever else comes, you're going to take that too into account. You're going to receive that too in your walk because you have already been accounted righteous. So we have to, you know, I'm talking to myself a lot. We got to stop thinking that our righteousness is based off of how much more we can, we can 
understand how much more we can do. It's not based off of that. It's based off of do you trust his word? Then it then you know whatever you learn, you're going to apply. That's what happened with the Gentiles. Acts 15, again, they didn't say, tell them this, 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 this. No, they said, tell them these things because these things they're doing right now. Tell them these things. And then every Shabbat, they're going to be studying. And since they received the Ruach, they're going to accept all of the things that they're studying. You see what I'm saying? Because they are already righteous. Their sins have already been forgiven. They have already received strength. They have already received that power. You see what I'm saying? Uh, go ahead, Amaka. And then there's one verse I want to point out in verse 9 and 10. Now, just what you what you brought out right now made me think of of King Saul, when uh, well, you know how he he began righteous, you know he he began righteous, but through disobedience, he lost that state of righteousness because he didn't choose to obey those things that he was being told, you know, and so that just it, what you said just made me think of King Saul real quick. Absolutely. King Saul is a, is a perfect example. He was born again. He received the Ruach, became another man, got another heart. He was a righteous, new creature. And then he threw it all away, you know, because he gave in to his other desires. Brother Rod, I see your, your, yeah, your, yeah, your I, mic. I, I, I like I like Omeka's example in Saul. Um, but I, but I, I would say... Um, and, I agree with that. That's 100 percent on point. I like the example you used last week um, with the socks, cleaning up your son's room. The socks on the on the ceiling fan. He can't even reach, even if he wanted to. You go mm -hmm. in and you get it all off, and he's got a clean slate. Like you can't go back to not having been clean. You're cleansed. Everything else becomes you keeping it that way. You you making sure you stay on that path, and you know which makes the ludicrous idea that we no longer have to obey the instructions that keep us on the path. It's ridiculous. It's can't you know. But but great great. I just wanted to, I could I'm listening to it and I wanted to shout out on the video because I wasn't there last week, but. That also ties into what you and the Mecca are saying now, you know, yeah. as far as, you know, having that clean slate, having been, you know, cleansed at that moment that, that you first believe your right. seed is righteous because you believe that blood washed your sin away, you know? Exactly. Great job. exactly. Take, take note, JP, Rod, is, he's, he's present. He's present even when he's not present. That's great. That's good. Copy That's that. Good. Copy that. Uh, so one more thing before we move forward is the verse 10. I wanted us to get a clear view and understanding and even a way to even explain this to someone else. Um, verse 10, it says, for as many as are under the works of the Torah are under the curse. Now, that to, to, to many people, it sounds like as, if you keep trying to keep Torah, you're under the curse. Look at what it says. It says, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the Torah to do them. That means that an individual is cursed because they're trying to keep something in their own strength that they're constantly breaking and failing to do. And Yah is saying, stop trying to do it of your own strength. You cannot do it. It was not created for you to do it that way. You see what I'm saying? So that's why it says, as many as are under the works of the law, that means as many as are trying to accomplish righteousness in their own strength and constantly breaking Torah, they're cursed. Why? Because, one, they neglect me to fear me and to allow me to circumcise their heart. Two, they continuously break it, so they're, all, they're constantly in the penalty. They don't have any clean slate. They are not coming to me to be cleansed. They're just trying to, you know, scurry and keep the next law, keep the next instruction. I broke the Shabbat. Let me keep the the tithing. Let me, I broke, 
you know, committing adultery. Let me keep, let me keep not murdering. Let me not murder nobody. You know, no, you can't clean up your act by doing something else that's correct. You know, I, I tell my children this too. Like sometimes my son, he'll do something wrong that I won't I, I meet an earthly man. I wouldn't find out until later. So he'll he'll do something wrong, and then he'll try to do a whole bunch of stuff right. And I'll be like, okay, yeah, that's good. And then I find out he did that wrong thing. No. We got to still address that wrong thing. So you got these people like, oh, yeah, let's keep the Torah. Then they're falling. Then they're like, no, 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 no let's keep the feast. Okay. But what about this problem over here? You didn't get you didn't get this problem settled, and the wages of sin is death. Messiah is necessary. You know, these people putting Messiah out of the out of the out of the picture to follow Torah, you ain't going nowhere. You're not going anywhere. You know, so it's interesting. We've got to make sure those who are of the works of the Torah, meaning that they're doing it in your own strength and you're not even doing it that well. You know, go ahead, JP. <laughs> right. uh, just to, to cross-reference that to um, Deuteronomy 27, 26. Mm-hmm. It says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. Of course, that's the last of the curses. Um, but I, I mean, I was just thinking at this point in time, they were, they were, you know, cause like you had just said right now, now we're, when we're in Galatians, we're reading it from a di- cause that's what I had read too. Just like you had said, curses, everyone that continued with not in all things, which are written in the book of the law to do them. So that's the cur- the curses to that one that doesn't continue in the, keeping the Torah, Right. Is that what you're saying? Is that what we're saying? The curse is the person that does not. Remember, he said, oh, oh, foolish Galatians, you want right. to try to finish it by the flesh. You start mm. in the spirit, you're trying to finish it by the flesh. When you remove Yaz, when you remove the Messiah's death from the equation, there's no, your sins are back. When you, when your belief of salvation is now it's now it's not Messiah taking my sins away. And it I have to be circumcised in order to be delivered, which is what salvation means. In order for me to be delivered from my sins, I have to be circumcised. Right. So so what's happening is when you approach the law with that mentality, you are already cursed. You if you try to keep the Torah without accepting the sacrifice and Messiah and Yah's Ruach, you are still, you are already cursed. So Later on, verse 16, we're going to see how the curse is actually taken away. Right, right. He's, so he's like, actually quoting uh, verse uh, Deuteronomy 27, 26 there. Right, right, right. No, and and, and that's what I had pulled up because I was thinking like, because I I guess this leads me to my question is, so at this time in Deuteronomy when they're given this instruction um, mm-hmm. of these cursings, were they to? Because now what we're saying is Messiah, but at that point, what would you say was it? Is it the sin offering that was to be given at that time? You know what I'm saying? It was always. Uh, they always had. They always were familiar with the, what the offering represented. They were always familiar. Matter of fact, Exodus Exodus twenty three, Yah tells them to follow the angel. Exodus twenty three verse twenty. He he starts telling him to follow the angel, the one that he's going to send with him to go to the place to take him to the place, and to obey him. You know. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that it was Messiah that they tested in Numbers chapter 21 where the fiery serpents bit them. That the spiritual drink was Messiah. Messiah was that rock that followed them. It's like there was a, a, there was a, 
uh, 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 understanding of who the son was. Psalms chapter 2, verse 11 says, Fear Yah and kiss the son, lest he be angry, lest the son is angry, and you perish from the way. That's Psalms chapter 2, verse 11. You know, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, where it says, Who has the wind in his fist? What's his name and what's his son's name? If you can tell, they knew who to believe in. Genesis chapter 3, that the serp, the woman, the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the head of the serpent. You know, everybody knew that the son was going to come. We're in a society where we didn't know because they changed everything. But they knew in scripture. So they, we don't have to, there's no, there's no doubt of, they, they were waiting for him to come. They were waiting for him to come. Deuteronomy 18, the prophet's going to come. He's like us. He's, in, he's like me, but you better listen to him. You listen to him. You see, who, who's that? Who does, who's that that they're talking about? The same person that they believed in, that they believed, they believed that he was their lead in them, who was the pillar during the day, who was the fire at night. It was the Messiah. It was, he was there. You know, the moment that we remove that reality and now have them clueless of who Messiah is, now it's like a mystical that they have to do it by works because there's nothing to believe in because they don't know him. But if you put him there, if you leave Messiah there from the garden where it says that the voice of Yah walked through the garden, if you leave him there, there's no way that you can do anything besides believe first. So now we're back to verse 10. As many as are under the works of the law, if you're trying to do this without faith, you are already cursed. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, that they had a heart in them that they would keep, that they would fear me and keep my commandments that it may be well with them always. I hope it's Deuteronomy 5, 29. I'm looking, I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just want to, I just want to uh, connect like my mind. I'm just wrapping my mind around these things. So when we're talking about, like, for instance, right now, we're in Galatians chapter three, we're talking about Galatians. So a people of Galatia that were, they weren't um, with this understanding, should I say, they didn't have this understanding of, of what, you know, cause I'm trying to, I'm trying to like, again, just, we had seen that word like a Mecca brought out in verse eight, heathen justified that the heathen. And we're, so we're talking about like, so this whole conversation is really directed to a people that, are not connected. They're not even with understanding. So he's trying to teach them. Paul's like coming and teaching them what the truth is and what the truth has been from the beginning. But these people, they didn't have it. Is that what we're saying here? No, he starts out by saying, who bewitched you? You had it. I already taught you. See, this is a letter. The right, letters right. When first came there. He already came there for months. You went a book of Acts. He's there months, three months, two years. You know, he's all the, all over the place. But now he's writing a letter saying, where are you going? You was already there, and now you going all the way over here. You see what I'm saying? So he's, he's telling them and tell, saying that it's the same thing as Israel. They were there, and they went all the way left. You know, and that's this is the problem. He's trying to now send a letter to bring them back. And Titus, I think Titus was the one of the ones that actually went to Galatia. And when he wasn't compelled to get circumcised, they were like, well, well, these guys came and told us. And that's why Paul was like, I don't know who these guys are. And whatever they are, didn't do nothing for me. Because I'm the one that Yah sent to you to tell you. You see what I'm saying? So they already knew. And then they're moving away from that belief, you know. Also, too, um, to the, the reason he mentions it, because like you said, he had already told them. He had already taught them. They already knew what Torah was, right? So when he mentions Deuteronomy, he's, he's simply lining that Deuteronomy up against what he says in verse 1 and 2. You become a curse because you failed at this. Right. But Yahusha became a curse for you, covering this, what you failed at, 
how are you now going to go back to being a curse again? Uh -huh. That's what he's saying. That's why he brings up Deuteronomy 27, 26. Right. To remind That's... them of what Yahushua came for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matter, matter of fact, let's, let's read um, verse 11 to 20 and correlate it. Um, and then we'll kind of get the picture broadened because he's going to go into the He's right now he's going into how to keep the Torah, what faith is, the Ruah. Then in the next chapter, he's going into the covenants. He's going into the 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 the, the Galatians is in that covenant. So that verse where it says that he justified the heathen, the heathen is a past tense. Is when you was a heathen, he justified you. Now you're a believer. You know, heathen is a is a non-believer. So when he justifies you, it means that he's making heathens into righteous individuals. You know, so they're no longer heathens after that. Did you go into who the Galatians were? Like where these people came from? Mm -mm. They were so so the Galatians were Celts. They were settlers, travelers, Vikings. These these dudes were raw diggity. They were the that so when they say heathen, think Viking. Think of what you see the Vikings do. These are the men that were converted. These are the men that, that went from what they believed in all these crazy gods to now believe in the gospel. And he's saying, I, you know, you, you received all of this. You were taken away from all this. How are you going back? You know, so just wanted to right. throw that in. These, these Galatians were raw, man. <laughs> these cats were. And I think he's going to mention it. I'm not sure if he's going to, I think he's going to mention it in this chapter. Let's, let's look at, yeah, let's let's look at this. Okay, so verse eleven. It says, "But that no man is justified by the Torah in the sight of Elohim. It is evident, for the righteous shall live by faith." This is from uh, Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. It says, "The Torah is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them." Who I love that. That statement there, because it has nothing to do with just doing stuff. It's being it, living it. It's a part of you. Verse 13, it says, Messiah have redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, being made a curse for us, because it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the nations through Yahushua the Messiah, that we might receive the promise of the Ruach through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's covenant, if it be not confirmed, no man can change it or add to it. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, which is Messiah. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of Elohim in Messiah, the Torah, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the Torah, it is no more of promise, but Elohim gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore, what's the purpose of the Torah? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator now a mediator is not a mediator of one but elohim is one elohim is one all right back to him establishing the justification you don't do laws in order to be righteous we should get out of our minds the feeling of righteousness when we're keeping commands that's not how we, we're not supposed to feel secure when we're keeping laws we're supposed to feel secure and live in them live in that security as as we do whatever he says to do you know so as we move on Messiah taking away the curse. This is the clean slate we talked about last week. He took away 
what we were not able to do, we took away what we tried to do on our, on our own. So he's reminding the Galatians, this is where you started. You started here where he took it away. There's no way that now you can't say, I'll take it from here. You can't say, I'll take it from here. He takes you all the way. He redeems you. And this is from this is just the redemption aspect. Then he he's resurrected in order to cause you to walk in his statutes. He causes you. As Ezekiel 36 says, Romans 6 talks about we live, you know, matter of fact, Galatians chapter 220 is not I who live, but Messiah who lives in me, right? So as we move forward, verse 14, it says, The blessing of Abraham, um, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the nations through Yahushua the Messiah, that we might receive the promise of the Ruach through faith. So the covenant, the covenant of promise cannot be changed, cannot be changed. This is evident that there is a difference between the covenant that was made, and it's interesting because it says that it was made to Abraham and to the Messiah, right? Abraham and to the Messiah. So when we go to Genesis chapter 17, he says, in Isaac shall your seed be called. In Isaac Everyone is going to be called through your son, Isaac. Isaac was a type of Messiah. Obviously, I think we all know the story of the sacrifice of Isaac and him carrying the wood, just like how Messiah carried the wood that he was going to be put on and all of those things. So we know that Isaac is the, is the type. So this is what was the promise. Isaac was a type of the promised seed that was, to, was, that was going to come. That everybody would be blessed. In, Gal in, in Genesis 17, it says, your seed shall be called by Isaac. That means everybody is going to come through Isaac. We don't hear that. Everybody understood that everybody is going through Messiah. So he said, even 430 years afterwards, what happened 430 years? 430 years is Sinai. Whatever happened at Sinai, you has to now continue what was promised. It can't change just because he added commandments. And what commandments did he add? He added a structure. Because remember, what was what was the thing that they were trying to, to do? They were trying to get the Galatians to try to work for their salvation. He's taking you back to Abraham to show you that it was always through belief. It was always through belief in the seed. Abraham knew this. So there's no way at Sinai, Moshe is not going to know this either. Moshe was trying to bring them to belief. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 and 19, he's like, fear not. He's trying to prove you so you can fear him and not sin anymore. The people left, and he went into the darkness believing. He didn't keep any laws to get in the, on the mountain. He believed. And this is what he's telling us. It's the same belief that Abraham had. doesn't matter what's added. It doesn't matter what's added in between. It's the same promise. It can't change. Even though he added more things that has to be kept, kept it doesn't change the promise. Now, what was added? They were telling them that they had a sacrifice also. They were telling, when you look at uh, 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 Acts chapter 15, they were not only telling them about uh, circumcision. They were also telling them about sacrificing also, going to the temple, going to the Levites, purchasing sacrifices from the Levites. But what does the scripture tell you? It tells you that Messiah fulfilled those things. So why are they trying to bring them back to try to, to appease Yah when Yah don't want to be appeased that way. He wants you to have faith and receive righteousness directly. You know? Um, so the added the added transgression wasn't like all the moral laws that he told them to do. It was the, the, the what they were telling them to do. Circumcision, uh, sacrificing, temple services, uh, purchasing sacrifices from the Levites in order to bring it to the altar. You know, those are the things that were added in 430 years. Everything else that was a moral aspect of living was now in the Torah 
that was given to Moses. It was given to Moses, but then there were other things added, and they were saying that those added things was the salvation. The sacrifice, the sacrificial system, sorry, there were always sacrifices after sin, but the sacrificial system in Leviticus, the temple, the altar, the Levite, the services of the blood, where it had to be sprinkled, all of that stuff, you know, all of that stuff is what, you know, was perpetuated. Circumcision was always a token. I can, I, we can, that's a, that's a, like a, that's a focused study. You see, nobody in the scripture is arguing about that. Nobody in scripture is having a big giant argument about circumcision. Even Paul is like, yeah, Titus didn't even want to get circumcised. Like, I'm not ta I'm not having a big letter sent to Tim Titus about circumcision. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. Circumcision is a token. And when that token came to fruition in Messiah, who's waiting for the promised seed anymore? You waiting for the promised seed to come again through through man? No. But anyway, so that mediator, I know that there's a, there's a verse in Deuteronomy in verse 19 where it says, it was added because of transgression to the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And um, JP, you got your hand up. Is that from last time or you, you raise it again? So it's been, it's been up, man, for like 20 minutes. I didn't know yeah. I <laughs> nah, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. I got something to say though. Nah, <laughs> uh, nah. Go put the chickens back. Uh, it says in Leviticus eighteen verses two. Uh, oh no! Well, let me get to eighteen verse four. You shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am Yahuwah Elohim. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am Yahuwah. Mm. And I, I like how you were speaking, you know, that's, we, we spoke about that before, just the, that walk in Torah, you know, that, you know, you just, it's in you, after, you know, it's not becomes, you know, because to somewhere there's like a checklist, you know, it's like a checklist of, okay, I, am I doing this? Am I doing this? Am I living like this? But when you're really just living it, it ain't a checklist. It's not like that. It's like, this is just you. You embody it. And it's so beautiful, you know, to do that because you're not concerned no more, like, am I doing this right or am I doing this wrong? Because you, you're doing it the way it's, you know it is already. You, you've already practiced, you know what I mean? Practice by looking at the scriptures. And of course, we got to go back and refresh. We come back to study. We get, you know what I'm saying, Shabbat after Shabbat and all that. But you just embody it. So that's a beautiful uh, understanding. Yeah. So that, this, sometimes there's people where it, they get afraid because they don't know if they're doing everything right. And that that shows something is missing. Something is missing. You know, you know that verse where it says, uh, God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. When you look at what it's talking about, it's not talking about being afraid. It's talking about being afraid of judgment. So if you go to that verse, you'll hear it talking about Yah's judgment and it says that he doesn't give us a spirit of judgment from him. If we believe there's no more judgment, there's no, no more condemnation for us. So why are we fearing, why are we having this fear of condemnation when even Romans 8 says there's, now there's no more condemnation for those who are in Yahushua, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Ruah. You know, so when that mindset, oh, I need to do this to be accepted, you were supposed to be accounted for righteousness the moment you believe. How can you receive righteousness and not be accepted by the righteous one? That doesn't make sense. How can you pull Hallelujah. power and he's not connected himself to you? You know, it's that's why it's bewitching. Like, who's bewitched you? It doesn't make sense to Paul. Uh, go ahead, Rod. Yeah, no, but, but, but. But I want to say this though, like one of the things we gotta we gotta look at, you know, <clears throat> you know, we definitely have to look at what Paul's saying, who has bewitched you. But at the same time, <clears throat> I liken it to you know, when I first started following Tory, not only you know coming to the realization, but then having to explain it to my wife, and we're reading till she's like, 
do we got to do that? Well, 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 what time does it start? You know, and, and we're trying to figure out what to do. Well, well all right, well, we got to throw that away. It's the feast. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 there's also ignorance that comes with it. It's, right. it's because the mind is to please Yah, not knowing that he's already pleased. It's just a matter of you understanding that this is now becomes your lifestyle. Right. Something, something like JP said, it be, it, it's not burdensome. It becomes easy once you realize this is what he wanted me to do. This is what he did. So now I follow that, you know, versus if I get this wrong, we forgot one item and it has yeast in it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like, that's not what it's about. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's about that, but it's not about that. Like, you're not condemned any longer. You're coming right. into the knowledge of how you now live. So I just wanted to throw that in because <clears throat> I can see how if they came in and started telling them these things, they would have started tripping out because they didn't right. know, you know, so. <clears throat> Absolutely. I, I didn't even think of it like that. But now I can see how they would start scurrying, like, oh, let's get these sacrifices going. Let's get all the men, circumcise them before, you know, especially being – being a heathen in the past, right? Those gods did that to them in their mind. Of course, there's no such thing as God. Those gods, but this is how they treated. Oh, there's a drought. The gods are punishing us. How many human sacrifices much we Absolutely. must? Yeah, that yeah. was their way of life. Yep. So now you have these guys talking about, yeah, you're not really truly saved unless you get circumcised, go purchase a sacrifice, offer it in a temple, let them administer the blood for you. You know, that's it's like almost some almost some Catholic church type stuff right now, but you know, this is where this is where they this is where they get to get it from. You know, when you look in the in the Reformation, like they were doing a lot of replication of 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 the the Levitical priesthood, if you if you want to look historically at the at the Protestant Reformation, you'll see that the Catholic Church was demonstrating uh, 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 intercessor intercessory type of attitude towards everyone else. They, you can't you can't do this. We do it for you. You can't do this. We'll pray for you. Matter of fact, we'll write down the prayers. You say exactly what we say, and then we'll forgive you. And they were actually <clears throat> in England. They would only pray and teach in Latin. Like they couldn't even understand what they were saying in the Catholic Church. They said, "This is the holy language. This is what how we spread the word to you." Like in another language, and they just had to sit there and say, "Amen," you know, right. and make the signet. But they didn't even know. They had to say, "Yo, you you got to speak so we understand, so we can right. see what you're saying is true." Right. <clears throat> when Martin Luther came and he wrote it in German and then the German people were reading it, it was like monumental. They were like, oh, wow, this is what it says? This is what Messiah said? Yeah. They didn't know what Messiah was saying, you know? So we we, we, see, we, got it, we get a little bit a picture of, of, this is how the heathen works. This is how the, the wicked, this is how the world is. They're dismayed. That's what it says. Don't be dismayed as the heathen is. When something happened, they're like, what can we do? What can we do? Not believe. What can we do to appease this 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 destruction? To get this, you know, uh, if you guys ever watch Apocalypto, I think it's based off of like some real Mayan pagan worship. When there was a famine, they cutting heads off every day cutting people's heads off every day to offer it to the gods just to get a drop of rain. You see what I'm saying? This is the mindset it was. So you tell somebody now you got to get circumcised, you got to offer a sacrifice. That's nothing compared to what they had to do with their pagan gods. So it was easy to go and corrupt the whole group of people to now go and offer a sacrifice, you know, circumcise yourself and then you're accepted. You know, it's, we have to get out of that mindset now. We're 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 borderline doing that now amongst our people. Everybody's like, "Yo, you got it." Like I, I've heard conversations where they start out like, "You don't have a beard. You're not keeping his commandments." Let's say, bro, bro, that 
Come on, man. They don't even know what commandments you're talking about. But anyway, we gotta be we gotta be clear as to what Moshe's message was. Go ahead, Brian, and then JP again, and again, again. Yeah, what Joe was just saying just now remind me of uh, in his true story last year. Uh, last year I was in we was in the Poconos and uh. And it was during unleavened bread, and I wasn't even—I wasn't even thinking. Um, uh, Brother West came down because I was right below his his uh, suite. He came down and uh, he gave me uh, a donut, and this was during unleavened. I wasn't even thinking. I told, I said, "Oh, how nice of him!" I took the donut, ate it. It was real good too. I was like, mm, "This is good." Then I was like, "Hold up, this is <laughs> unleavened bread." I'm not supposed to be eating this and stuff, but then it's like when you, I thought about it, it's like you know what? It's it's it's. I mean, when you understand the spiritual significance of what what the when the when the, we we talk about the um, worshiping in spirit and in truth, um, Yahusha told a, told his told the people in uh, Matthew sixteen six. He said, "Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees," which in that case is is the is the uh, wrong teaching. Um, and, and, and wrong doctrine and things and so while yeah it's like it's like everything that's physical points to the spiritual reality of, of what's in your heart the, I empty out the leaven out of your heart and it's like much more profitable to examine right. your heart than to, to then don't get me wrong it's like if I would remember I wouldn't have ate the donut but um <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I was just thinking it, about the spiritual, the spiritual understanding of, of, of what, it, what what's more important, what's more profitable. Um, right. It's to examine my heart and make sure that like, I'm I'm seeking Him and, and worship Him in, in spirit and truth. And uh, yeah. So. And this is one of those things that we were talking about earlier about correcting publicly. <laughs> I remember having a conversation with Wesley because we were we were we were making unleavened bread. And we was at, you know, every day. And um, there's a principle in in the in the symbol. It's just like, you know, when you eat the bread and the wine, you're not gonna eat like a donut and a grape soda. You know what I mean? You're gonna <laughs> you're gonna use unleavened bread and and some good juice to represent the symbolic understanding of of his of his body and his blood. You know, but I hope nobody's using a donut and grape grape soda. This is yeah, it's that, very that's just too much. That sugar on top of sugar, that do that wouldn't even taste taste good. You gotta talk to Wes. He handing out donuts. Well, Wes knows that. After that, after you know, that's the funny thing. Wes was kind of Wes is kind of like it, it was kind of the same as me. As it was like I didn't know how to count the moon. I didn't know what how the year worked. I, but I studied the feast, the significance of the feast. Once I got the significance, then I started learning all the stuff around it. And at that point, he was like trying to marry in his mind the two uh, between the significance and the demonstration. So it could be it could be one, and that's good because sometimes people do the demonstration without what what Brian said, focusing on the 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 actual reality of it. But when you focus in on the reality of it, there's also the exercising of the demonstration because of the reality as, as well. Uh, the command, exercising the command and demonstrating the reality together is what Moshe and them did, you know. I mean, we're not offering no sacrifices, but when it comes to what we can do, when it comes to the bread and the wine, nobody's playing no games with that. You read 1 Corinthians 11, it says you dying. You take it unworthily, you did. You get sick and you dead, you know. So we can't play around with sim, sim, even the symbols. We can't play around with. We don't have that liberty. We have submitted to a master. Yahushua was our master, you know. So, but is is good that that you saw the combination or, or the significance had to be elevated just as much as the demonstration. If you have the demonstration without the significance, it's nothing. If you have the significance and don't know how to do the demonstration, that's what matters. But once you learn how to demonstrate and have the significance, this is the this is the living aspect of it, you know. So, um, 
But praise y'all. Praise y'all. Let me, uh, JP, in the place to be. Yeah, yeah. We Next time Wes is on here, we're going to bring that up. Just, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to bring it up, man. Hey, no, nah, yeah. no, nah, he, he ain't, huh? He, he probably jumped right off when he heard that. He's like, I'm out. No, <laughs> 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 no, nah, nah, but, but you know, just speaking about with well, that verse, you had brought up a verse earlier, and it said um, in 2 Timothy 1 7, for Elohim had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and right. of love and of a sound mind. And, and it's like, you know, because we, we spoke about the, the fear or the reverence, you know, of Yahuwah. You know, mm-hmm. and and there is that, you know, there's that reverence where I want to, I want to just, I'm, I'm, that's my life, right? That's it. I'm just, my reverence is daily to him. And, but like what we're talking about, but there's that, that, you know, I, if you, if you go in, like Brian has spoke about, you know, he just kind of was like, oh man, I slipped up. You know what I mean? I didn't even think about it. Stuff like that. It's just like, but over time, and I know this scripture that I'm in First Corinthians three seven. It says, "So neither is is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but Elohim that giveth the increase." I even still think about that for myself in this process that I've been walking in with Yahuwah. It's like He's been given the increase, like like the scriptures, Shabbat after Shabbat, study after study. Every time I read a verse, and I'm like walking in it. You know what I mean? And I'm like, at the end of the day, He's given the increase. You know, my brother's here, you know, they'll, they'll share something with me, how to live, you know what I mean? What they're doing in their life, how they're keeping their Shabbat, what they're, and I'm absorbing it, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm absorbing it, and I'm just like, and then Yahuwah gives the increase, you know, on me, like, in a personal walk, like, how am I supposed to go? So, it's just that sometimes I feel like in this walk, some people can beat themselves down. You know what I mean? They could beat themselves down. And then all of a sudden they're like, they're on that checklist. And then they're, they're, they're just like, and it's like, are you doing this because you love Yahuwah? Are you doing this because you just want to, you know, it's like you're, you're trying to get a paycheck or something. You know what I mean? I love Yahuwah, so I'm going to do this in that way. You know what I'm saying? To walk this out. Like, so I just want to share that because I, I felt well, there's some. That, that with the, um. Uh, spirit of fear verse you said uh, 2 Timothy 1 7 so 2 Timothy 1 7 yeah hallelujah right yeah brother Donnie go ahead brother it's Shalom bro uh, brothers I've um it's a good study there as always um Really help it help me uh really examine myself on a lot of things uh coming into this walk. Uh, praise y'all for that. Um but I heard you saying something about um the beards. Is it is it wrong to cut your beard or or face your hair? Because I hear some people say you shouldn't cut it and you know, a lot a lot of the the, the guys that I know that's in this walk will let their beards and stuff grow, but is it Will it become a, uh, I don't think it will become a sin if you cut your hair, but is it, is it wrong for you to do that? Brother Rod, you want to? Yeah, not. Nah. So, so in scripture, there, there are specific ways in which Yah is saying, don't cut your beard, rounding your beard, because it meant something. If you look at the Egyptians and you see the way they, their beards and they were rounded and they were cut also. Well, the shaving off of the face also had to do with being nondescript as far as knowing from a male to a female. So, but as far as us cutting our beards or that shaving or not, that's not, you know, going to believe that. Yeah. You answer it's, that it, it, yeah. No, you answered it correctly. It, it uses specific things like mar. Mar, and it, when you look up the definition, is very broad. Destroy, you know, when you're when you're trying to. What they did was they etched it a lot of different places as well. Uh, this is why it talks about the braiding of the hair. It's not saying don't braid. It's saying that what they did it for was for a, a public display. It was a display aspect that they that Yah was trying to get his people to move away from. 
we were trying to he was trying to avoid us from being demonstra displayed to to the nations to be more humble and calmly you know as as we're described as a calmly woman it says in Gen jeremiah uh six four it says i i look at the daughter of zion as a calmly and delicate woman you know and then even in revelation you have the woman in revelation 12 with a white dressed in the sun with the crown and then you have the harlot with the jewels and the the golden cup with the blood of the saints and the purple and scarlet on and all that, you know, so, and, and then we go to the woman in uh, first Peter uh, chapter three, where it talks about women should ought to not adorn themselves so much outwardly as a display, but the inward of a peaceable and quiet spirit displaying that humility, you know, so what he wanted us to do was move away from, from the shaving of the beard. There was a time in which these guys went to this, uh, they were, basically taken and then they shaved them and they also cut their clothes so that way their private parts would show you know and because they it was like a shameful act not to cut your beard but to they were humiliated by these people and they didn't want to go before their people humiliated so david said go to this place you know you know get yourself together wait till your beard grow back and then go back it wasn't like oh yeah it's a sin so don't come around unless your beard grows back. No, it was they were they were sent home to be humiliated by this nation, and David said, "Go back, so you won't be have to deal with that shame in front of your people." You know, so there's a, there's a lot of things that we apply condemnation to and sin to when the context is not really revealed in that in scripture. You know. Um, Great job for that. Thank you, all Elder. No, definitely, uh, Brother Paul. Go ahead, brother. Shalom, shalom, family. Uh, I just want to say, really, I uh, really appreciate um, that study today because um, I'm just coming into the truth, and there's a lot of, you know, I was, I was one of the person who's just thinking about, am I doing this wrong or doing this right? Because you just, when you just come in, you, you're trying to figure out everything, and you know, I know there is faith, and you believe, but then you still, now you're trying to follow the Torah, and then there's different calendars, there's different laws. And then uh, one of the things a lot of people who are listening to, um, because I got in touch with some of the camps and they were saying, oh, you got to, your beard, you got to, you know, so it's, it's all, it was very confusing because you, you're saying like, okay, you have to, it's, it's like they're pushing works, like you, you have to do this and you have to do that instead of just saying, hey, believe and it's going to come, it's going to come, it's, it's going to come. Just, just worry about your relationship with your whoa. And, and learning so that was really um great i'm uh, really grateful for you bringing out that especially that uh brother wes when he was uh talking about the feast that was really a good example too because you have to study the importance and stuff on that um right. on the beards one of the things that i was always thinking about too while reading about it was that uh and the same thing with my hair like the length of your hair and stuff there was a uh, I remember there was a scripture, I can't remember what scripture it is, but um, it was talking about the nature, the love of nature, something to that extent where um, it was saying it's wrong for a man, when Paul was saying it's wrong for a man to have long hair. Long and um, I took that to the whole thing. I took that to, I don't know if I'm right, but I'm going to ask you. Um, it was talking about like um, the same thing. A lot of the heathens, they, they had certain customs and stuff that they were following. And it was basically saying like, a, uh, in some, like in my culture, for example, um, I'm from the Caribbean and there's certain people who have, they shave their heads for uh, religious purposes. And if you know that's a custom in your law, I was wondering if Paul was thinking, if, if, it's, if there's a heathenistic custom which is against the nature or the, like the culture, if, if that applies to what he was talking about, like if it's a culture over there, the way they shave their head in, like, in regards to like a false worship, then you don't want to follow them. I'm, I'm wondering if that's part of it too. I just wanted to ask that question. That is definitely part of it because it was multiple things that he also referred to. Anything that the heathen did, he wanted to sh set us apart from. You know, So if you're in a culture in which the heathen is demonstrating something it's it's more likely but it depends it's not like you don't want to force a, a a sinful 
display on something like, like somebody wears shoes to work. Everybody wears shoes to work. So now because the heathen wears shoes to work, I'm not going to wear shoes to work. You know, that's a little bit, but more cultural standpoint, more traditional standpoint. Um, those things Yah wanted us to be far from as far as our culture is, is concerned, uh, as far as our belief, our walk, our mental, uh, what we thought, how we presented ourselves. When they saw a person from a different nation, they knew who they were. They were like, oh, you're a Hebrew, or you're an Ammonite, or you're a Canaanite. They knew based on, they even, he told them not to take the Canaanite clothing. So obviously even their clothing was different, you know, so when you look at First Corinthians 11, where it talks about the long hair, it was talking, it was a, 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 a kind of like a reference to the, the, the display. Like it's a, it's a sin to display your hair like a woman. Uh, when you look at the Nazarites, the Nazarites didn't cut their hair. Uh, one of the brothers that we keep feast with, his name is Ian, and he has, he has long white hair you know, long white beard because he said he was in the Nazarite Valley. And then he's also a health worker. When he touched a dead body, you know, he cut it all off, you know. So a Nazarite usually had long hair, you know. So to it wasn't a matter of having long hair as a matter of displaying it as a woman displays it. And when you look in Deuteronomy, it talks about the display. Don't wear that which pertains to a woman, and a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man. But it's more broader than that. You shouldn't display yourself as a man if, if you're a woman, you shouldn't display yourself as a woman if you're a man. Um, uh, but, but there is a lot of traditional things going on in, in different, even like just from one thing that I saw in, in the Arabic culture, I'm not sure what tradition it is, but there's many videos that I've saw in which Arabic men would display like a celebration and, and there would be some type of funny looking dudes there displaying themselves as women you know i'm not sure if, if that's just the rich arabic culture or whatever tradition it was it was that's not how yah wants us to display ourselves he talks in in romans chapter one he talks about the effeminate the effeminate aspect and the word effeminate is just is is literally talking about a display uh, of a man displaying themselves over over feminine or over like like a female and a female displaying themselves over masculine, you know, um, and that's kind of what he's telling us to stay away from. You see, our culture with the women, if you're like a strong businesswoman, you have to like cut your hair. You, you see these women bosses with their hair cut short, and then they have the shoulder pads and they got the pantsuits. <laughs> it's like there's a look to display yourself as strong. And Yah is like, we don't need none of that. We display ourselves as humble and let Yah bring our strength, be our strength and reveal our strength when that time comes. You know, he doesn't want us to false display ourselves. He wants Yah to be our display, his character to be our display. Um, I don't want to over explain, but when, when, when the people came to Jerusalem, Solomon displayed who Yah was rather than displaying himself. When the people came to see Hezekiah, he showed him everything that he had. And Yah was like, you know, the destruction that's going to come on Israel because of this mentality. It wasn't because he did something that he's going to destroy his children. It's because of this display. His children learned palm pride, and that was going to destroy Israel. You know, so this is what he wants us to move away from. He wants us to display something that will glorify him, you know, and, and that's kind of the main point. Yeah, and I add to what Jadiel's saying, you know, with the with the with the feminine aspect, um, a lot of what they were displaying as well with their hair, the way it was cut, also signified their false gods. And he didn't want us to do those same things as well. So all of that plays into the whole right. understanding about the cutting of the hair and wearing your hair that is right. that is always or very often um, misinterpreted, and uh, we get these extra things added in that aren't in scripture at all. Right, right, and, and it's just one culture. I'm from from New York, so they have a from up north, and they have this haircut. It's called well, 
in New York is different. They have a, a haircut called the Caesar, right? So it's called the Caesar. But in New York, it's not really a Caesar. A Caesar is, is you cut everything low, but that's not a Caesar. We call a Caesar tape up. It's like when you cut the side going diagonal around your head, the way that the reef, the Greek reefs used to go from here between the ear, down under the head, then up around. And they call that a Caesar because the Greek, the Greek culture, that's what they had. Uh, the Roman, the Olympics, the Roman, the wreaths, those are all pagan displays. And they have a haircut called the Caesar. You know, but up north they've changed it. Caesar is not really a Caesar. But down south, I, I went to the barber. I said, can I get a Caesar? Because I wanted them to cut everything off. And they put the thing in, around my head. <laughs> and I was like, what in the world is this? You know, so that's when I realized, yeah, oh, you, Johnny, yeah, you know you was trying to get the Caesar, man. Come on. <laughs> I don't mess with Caesars. New York Caesars. Uh, um, yeah, this is this is very good because one thing that we got to know is that they, they understood, like what Emeka was saying, they understood the culture and the, the, the transition that they were going into a different culture. And we got to understand that as well. We can't just look at certain things as just some commands that God's given, but lifestyle changes from something else a lot of times is what he was trying to help us to, to recognize as well. You know, but those are good questions because we got to know what, what it's coming from before we actually walk in it completely, you know. Um, all right, so let's let's finish the rest of these verses. Oh, go ahead, Rod. Yeah, I was going to say one of, one of the other things, too, that we got to understand about the instructions are, <clears throat> Johnny L just mentioned the fact of the culture, but you also got to understand that he's telling them some things that they have seen. Right. Some of these things may have even been happening by the Hebrews. Like they may have been doing some of these things from what they learned. And he's saying, don't do this anymore if you're doing. It. So so that's also part of it. Getting rid of all of those customs, even in the Hebrew Hebrew nation. So. Right. Absolutely. Especially the Hebrews who uh, at the time there was a, the mixture The you know, the 10 tribes were mingling with Assyrians and a lot of the Samaritans were not really just Samaritans. Some of them were Samaritans and some of them were actually mixed breeds, you know, that would bring that culture into the, you know, so he wanted us to be set apart completely. And, and I think that we should still apply that same principle today. Our culture is not the same as the, these heathen cultures before, but it's still a culture of display, of showing off. And we need to make sure that we're showing off who Yah is rather than showing off who we are, glorifying ourselves. Uh, go ahead, Brother Paul. Yes. Um, before you go too far, um, sorry. Um, there was a question that I had on um, the scripture of being accursed, uh, where Jesus, where Christ, where um, Messiah died on the um, right. to, for us, and he was uh, accursed. I was wondering why he had to be accursed, or because I know he died on the tree to be accursed, so that. But I, I don't understand why he had to be had to be uh, accursed by dying on the tree. So I don't know if you could explain that for me. Also. Um, we can go back to Leviticus where it talks about the actual sacrificial system. This is the system that was added. Uh, the system that was added was the understanding that when you, they put their hands on the sacrifice, that there was a transfer. There was a transfer of guilt from the individual to the, to the actual sacrifice fit by faith. And then that sacrifice bore the penalty that sacrifice then became cursed and the blood was the atoning blood. It was a symbol of the atoning blood, which was the cleansing blood of the one who was going to come. So Messiah became a curse, not when he hung on a tree. That was just the manifestation that he was cursed. He was cursed when he had the sins on him. So when the sins came on him, which freed us from our guilt, he became a curse and then they hung him on the tree. If you look at his life, before he took the sins on himself, 
they could not touch him. They would drag him to the cliff and he'll walk right through them. They never, they never did it because his hour was not yet come. But when his hour was come, Yah allowed him to bear the sin of the world on him. And that's what made him uh, open and susceptible for them taking him, kidnapping him and killing him because that was a manifestation that Yah has moved his hand from you. Because before, they could not touch him. They could not do anything to him. All right, Brother Rod. So um, when it says that he became a curse, so that way he redeemed us from the curse, he became a curse to redeem us from the curse. So the way that a curse is, is that Yah has removed himself from you. So what he's saying is that we are no longer removed from Yah because Messiah has taken that upon himself so that way we can be joined together to Yah. So that's what it means by redeemed. So he has redeemed us from the curse or from being separated from Yah, and he has put it on himself so Got he it. can bear the penalty for us. Got that. Thanks. No, no problem. It talks about that quite a bit, even in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, um, verse... Uh, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 to, to 20, 21. Go ahead, JP. Uh, just, I don't know. Did you, did you uh, speak on verse 20? I don't know if we ever, if we spoke on that or not. I don't know. I was just thinking about it because it seems like an interesting verse. To, and I was better. trying to, yeah, yeah. You know, so I was like, and I was connecting with 19. I said, well, let me read 19. It says, wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but Yahuwah or Elohim is one. Um, well, I, you know what? Let me, let me uh, I have this question on verse 19. Cause I was looking at that. It says, you know, cause I was thinking about the law, you know, the law is made for the unrighteous. It says in scriptures, and I was thinking, wow, like, you know, so that's what the law, the law is to get, keep us on that. It was to get us on that, like we were speaking about earlier, like keep us on that right place. But once you're on that right place, well, then the law just is there. It's in you. It just, it just becomes a part of you. And you don't really, you're not concerned, like, like we were speaking on earlier. But here I can see where, you know, it can be seen. It says it was added because of transgressions, right, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And I mean, I can see where somebody would look at this and say, okay, the law was there until the seed should come, right? right. I mean, is that how people do see it today in certain organizations and, and congregations where they, to where they say, okay, the, the, the law is done now because the seed has come. I'll leave it there. So, so is, here's the interesting part. The seed that's supposed to come is supposed to actually obtain the promise, right? So they said that the promise was given to Abraham and to Messiah. It says it was given to Messiah before. Um, so when you go back and look at the promise, what's the promise? The promise to, what's the promise to Messiah? Land, his, his own place. When Messiah came the first time, did he get his own place? Did he fulfill the promise? So the promise that was given to Abraham was that he was going to receive the world. That's what it says in Romans four, Romans chapter 4, verse 13. When Messiah first came, it was a totally different mission. It was so he could redeem us. When he comes the second time, it's to take us to the place that he has prepared which is the promise the promise is coming when the seed comes the second time not he not the first time so right now people are interpreting that when the seed comes that's the promise but when you go back to genesis he promised him he told him look look, look up look left look right right look self he promised him his own territory when Messiah came, he was more focused on redeeming his people so he can bring his people to his own territory. But 
many people they're not thinking about it. They only focus on the promised seed. Oh, so Messiah came. So that's it. No. Because Messiah has to get a promise. There was a promise made to him. And it wasn't fulfilled when he first came, but it will be fulfilled later on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, now, now I think you can uh, get into 20 now. Share some, share some of your thoughts on 20. I would like to hear. There's a verse in Deuteronomy. I'm not sure if it's 30. 31. I know it takes us to Exodus, but there's an actual, the actual wording. Well, I mean, I know it's in the Shema. I know that for sure. The Deuteronomy what? six four. What does it say? Well, well, the 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 mediator, right? Oh, the, yeah, it doesn't say the mediator there, though, but it does say, you know, um, our Elohim is one. Our, well, it doesn't say Elohim, actually, it says Yahuwah. That's what I like about that. When you see the correct translation, Deuteronomy 6 4, Hero Israel, Yahuwah, our Elohim is one Yahuwah. But right. it doesn't mention There's, mediator, so. The, that, that verse is actually a quote from Deuteronomy. It's just that it's not. I don't know why it's not put in the, in the references, but it's literally a direct quote from, from Deuteronomy. And the mediator is not Moshe. Mm. The mediator is the one that gave it to Moshe. I'm trying to look for it right now. Let me see. But the Mashiach is our uh, mediator. Mashiach is our mediator, right. Right, right, right. Okay. Mediator. One mediator between Yah and men. Uh, right. Yahushua, uh, he's always been the mediator between men because when men sinned, they were not able to direct. Right. Direct Where does Moshe come from? Well, Moshe, many people think that Moshe is the mediator between Yah and men in, in, in Exodus. Um, because he but, went on the mountain? Yeah, because he went on the mountain. Oh, okay. Right. okay, okay, okay. Right. They they don't they don't keep into account the fact that Moshe also needs a mediator. He also needs deliverance and salvation yeah. for himself. Because when and Moshe was on the, when Moshe was on the mountain, it was the it was the ruach of Mashiach was speaking to him. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Absolutely. But I like to there's a there was a there's a direct verse that actually quotes that whole part in um, verse 19 and 20 of Galatians 3. Um, I'm, I guess I'm going to have to find it later. Yeah, I'm going to find it later. If I find it next week, we're going to probably go over. Uh, yeah, because most people in uh, the Christian churches uh, uh, believe in that it was uh, um, our Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, that was speaking to Moshe in the, in the mountain, in the bush, but it was the, the Ruach of the Mashiach. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. It says in uh, I think it's Exodus it three, it the Malak, the Malak of Yahuwah was in the burning bush speaking, speaking on behalf of Yahuwah. Right. I believe that's Exodus three. Uh, go ahead, Amaka. Before we go to the next, the last verses. Was it Deuteronomy five twenty two? You're looking for. Deuteronomy 5.22. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Or is 18.15. You talking about when he said a prophet like him too? No, 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 no. It's literally, um, it says that the, the, the law was ordained in the hands. Um, okay. I don't get them 5.22 then. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, verse 21, it says, Is the Torah then against the promises of Elohim? God forbid. For if there been a Torah, if there been a Torah given that could have given life, then righteousness would have been by the Torah. But the scripture has concluded everyone under sin that the promise of faith in Yahushua the Messiah might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up until the faith. 
which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Messiah, that we might be made righteous by faith. But after the faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for we, for you are all the children of Elohim by faith in Yahushua the Messiah. For as many of you as were baptized in the Messiah have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew, Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Yahushua the Messiah. And if you be Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. <clears throat> so here we go. Again, if you understand Torah, he's not saying that Torah is now moved out of the way because faith is here. Is that Torah was supposed to bring you to faith. So if we're studying Torah and it's not bringing or elevating or explaining faith and righteousness, then we're not reading it correctly. Um, it says that when we, are, when we receive and understand faith, then we are no longer under a schoolmaster. It doesn't mean that the schoolmaster is gone or, or that we have no need for the schoolmaster. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. Some, some says tutor. You know, when you have a tutor, um, there, there's a difference between studying it, tutoring it, and refreshing yourself in it. You know, applying it. Every profession, st well, if they're, if they're really good, go back and refresh themselves. There's many professions in which um, they have courses that they have to refresh themselves in order for them to stay fit for the actual occupation. Likewise, when it comes to following Yah, though you are no longer under the schoolmaster, there's still a necessity. Why is there a necessity? So you can be equipped. Why? Because there's many who have not yet come to the faith. So if you needed a schoolmaster to come to the faith, then you are now able to use the, the tutor to bring others to the faith as well. You don't discard of the tutor when the tutor helped you come to faith. So how would you bring someone else to faith? The same way you was brought there, you know, by the tutor, by the Torah. But you have to understand how to utilize the Torah, how to manifest faith and righteousness from the Torah. If you are unable to do that, you have to now study it. You are now under the Torah until you have established. This is what the word faith means, emuna, st stability. St established yourself in the understanding of righteousness from the Torah, from the prophets. Once you have established that, you are now no longer under a tutor, but you utilize the tutor to bring others to Messiah as well, to establish others as well. Um, I think that's pretty clear. And when you are established, it says here in verse 29, you are Messiah's, and then you are Abraham's seed, and then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are not heirs according to the promise if you have a misunderstanding of the faith. If you understand the faith, then you are Messiah's. And if you are Messiah's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Go ahead, Emeka. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, yeah, you know, what, yeah, everything you said right now was on point. Um, and it, it's so interesting because you look at why, like, if we go back to Exodus, you look at why the, you know, that law, when we speak about that law being added, you see exactly why, because of lack of belief and obedience. Like, these people didn't believe Yah, therefore they disobeyed Yah, you know? Right. And so you see exactly why that law was added, because if they were just like, all right, we're going to obey Yah's commandments, we're going to teach them to our children, do all this and that, I'm not saying he wouldn't have, but yeah, there wouldn't have been a need if they were going to walk in obedience to Yah's instructions. Absolutely. There wouldn't have been a need for a law of sin, like uh, the sacrificial law. For sin, it wouldn't have been needed, but because that, they did, they it. disbelieved, and they walked in transgression. Yes, you know that's why the the the, the sacrifice the sacrifices came. So yeah, no, okay. absolutely. I think yeah, absolutely. What you just said is so now, now it goes back to I think the question was how do they know 
Messiah back then, all of those symbols was to bring them back to the faith in Messiah, the faith that they were supposed to originally have. And because of their lack of faith, they had symbols representing the faith, the priesthood, the temple, the offering, Messiah, the people, you know, the, the praise the, from our lips, the heart service, not the, not the lip service. So Mecca, that's, that's basically, with that principle, anytime that you're discussing Torah, that principle magnifies everything else in Torah. Because of transgression, because of lack of faith, more laws were added to promote faith. So now when you read Galatians 3, the schoolmaster was to bring us to faith, bring us to Messiah. Because of their lack of faith, we have these systems placed in order. So why do people think that these systems are going to come back in a faithful society in the future? Doesn't make any sense. If the priesthood and the sacrificial system and the temple are to promote faith, and then when faith comes, how would these things now come back to a faithful community? It can't. Mm. There's no purpose. Yeah. You, know, you know, it's know. interesting you said that because you think about like Mashiach in, in Deuteronomy chapter chapter four, verse verses five, six, and seven. Moses is telling the people, behold, I have laid, you know, before you statutes and, and judgments as, you know, uh, Yahuwah, my Elohim has, has given me, you know, that you should do them. Um, you know, he says, this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations that shall uh, hear all these uh, statutes and say, surely what great nation is there um, that, is, you know, uh, that has Elohim, so this is the, the key part, that has Elohim so nigh onto them as Yah Yahuwah Elohim is in all things that they, we call upon him for. So it's like, he's most just literally telling you, this is the, do the statutes and judgments so that Yahuwah is in all things that you call upon him for. You know, that was the faith. Right. Like, the faith was calling upon Yahuwah to have him you know, to have him come through. That was the faith. Like, yo, do these statues so he'll come through when you need him. <laughs> that was it. That was the essence of the faith and still is to this day. Even it says in, in, in 1 John chapter chapter 5, uh, he tells him, he says, you know, this is the confidence that we have in him that, if, uh, that when we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, you know? Right. And so what is Yah's will? Yah's will is that we sanctify ourselves. You know, Paul says it's, it's, it's his Yah's will that we possess, you know, one, we, we believe in the Son, that we may have everlasting life, and two, that we, we sanctify ourselves. You know, we possess our, our vessels in sanctification and honor. You know, so if it, that's his will, then guess what? If we're possessing, you know, we believe in the Son, we possess our vessels in sanctification and honor, then when we go to the Father and ask, it, ask of him, he hears us. That's the faith. Absolutely. Praise God. Go ahead, Brian. Brian? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I to unmute myself over here. But, uh, but yeah, that's interesting. Though, I thought about that myself at, like, the Mount Sinai, had the children of Israel have the faith, their, uh, their heart been in the right place, would that whole Levitical priesthood been necessary? And I think you just answered, y'all just answered the question. It would not have been because uh, in Exodus 19.6, it says that uh, y'all say I'll make you a, a kingdom of priests, which, uh, uh, what was that? No, no, I'm I'm just, I'm agreeing with you. Oh, no, yeah, I was sorry. Yeah, he said I'll make you a kingdom of priests. And, mm -hmm. um, and and so it's like he's not making a specific like a decree on a, a specific tribe. He's just saying, I'll make you a kingdom of priests. And so it's like, right. I, I was thinking about what Moshe was saying when uh, Joshua rebuked the, uh, the elders that didn't come up 
he didn't know that they were the elders and it was prophesying. And, and then Moses told him, why are you rebuking? And I, I wish that all, everybody would prophesy. So, and so it was like, this was his, uh, Yah's original plan, but, but the children of Israel were not ready because they was like, oh, you just uh, let, let us hear from Moses and let us not hear from, from, the, from Yah else we die. And so it's like, yeah, it's like, like, okay, like, it's almost like, yeah, yeah, you got to go through the schoolmaster because your faith is so, right. it's like so lacking that you had to like start from ground zero and, uh, and, uh, and everything like that. So yeah, that's interesting. Cause I thought about that myself, but yeah, it's like, it's interesting. So yeah, that's all I had. hundred percent. I agree. Exodus 19 and then Peter. Peter, after the Ruach has been falling on the nations and the Yahudim that believed in Yahushua the Messiah, he requotes Exodus 19 in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where it talks about you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, uh, a set-apart nation, peculiar people, uh, that you show forth the praises of him that have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's the same quote. That whole 1 Peter chapter 2 is talking about Exodus 19. They are now fulfilling Exodus 19. If they was, if they were believing in Exodus 19, there would be no need for Exodus. What was it? Exodus 28 to 30 to 33, with the whole, the whole thing, man. Like where they, because of their lack of faith, they needed instruments in order to reveal to them their faith, in order for them to see it, in order for the, it, them to grow, you know. Um. And even now, we still got symbols. We still got the bread and the wine. We still, we have the Shabbat as a day, to as a sign that Yah sanctifies us. We still have it because we're still in that. We still are in the flesh. But we are submitting our minds to the reality. We're submitting our minds to the reality. And that's what he wanted them to do. This is what Moshe did. This is what Joshua did. And you're absolutely right. Numbers chapter 11 when they, when they received the Ruach and they began to prophesy and Joshua was like rebuked them and he says, do you, do you not know that Yah wants all of his people to be prophets? So if they believed that, you know, I, I don't like to dwell too much on it because then I feel disappointed, but so much that Yah wants to do. But here's the beautiful thing that there's so much that Yah is willing to do now to show us what faith can do now. You know, so we don't have to worry about what they didn't do. We just have to now give ourselves so that way it can be manifested exactly what he wanted to do before, you know, so praise Yah. Um, so this concludes uh, Galatians chapter three and uh, see you guys next week. Shalom. Shalom, Akuti, and Rohim. Thank you so much for viewing this video. We hope it was helpful to your walk in the truth. Remember to always search the scriptures on your own, to study Abba's word, and show yourself approved according to 2 Timothy 2.15. We invite you to study with us. To join us in a live study, just go to our website at assemblyofyahuwah.com and click the Join Us tab. We have something available Wednesday through Saturday of every week. If you've been Baruch or blessed by this video today or any other study, we encourage you to go to the Giving tab on our website. Our elders all have their own ways of income, so none of the giving or proceeds go to them. Instead, it goes to biblical assembly needs. We also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any new videos. We sincerely pray that Abba continues to direct your path as you acknowledge Him in all your ways. Much avaha and again shalom.